uh, ready to get started? Oh, cool. It's working. Yay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to Care Not Cuffs Pathways to Providing Healthcare for Health Needs. Uh, my name is Taylor Adams, and I'll be moderating the session. So if you need anything, just let me know. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple things I want to share with you. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to those who are joining us online. Uh, be sure to post your questions for our speakers in the chat, um, and, I'll, and I'll be able to share that with Vincent. Uh, this session is worth one hour of CE credit. If you are interested in receiving continuing education credits, visit the CEs through the NASW VA tab on our conference app or virtual platform. After the session, please make sure to complete the session evaluation form that is listed in the session description. Uh, don't forget to post on social media using hashtag MHACOMP22 and tag at Mental Health America. Uh, lastly, we know some content can be triggering, so please take care of yourself. Um, if you need to step out or, or log off, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, also, if you're in person, you can visit our wellness room in Yellowstone Everglades on the second floor. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, uh, Vincent Atchity. Did I get that correct? Yes. <laughs> a PhD is a public health and health equity advocate, population health management strategist, and bridge builder who connects communities and community partners with improved health outcomes and more efficiently managed expenses. Vincent has previously served on the Colorado Gov Governor's Mental Health Holds Task Force and the Colorado Opioid Epidemic Symposia Steering Committee, and he currently serves on the Colorado Public Defender Commission, the Colorado School of Public Health Behavioral Health Initiative Advisory Board, and the board of a federally qualified health center. So please welcome Vincent. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just apologize to begin with about that triggering issue. Um, in my staff, we joke about how lots of people complain about going to work on Monday mornings, but when we get back to work on Monday mornings, we're immediately plunged into teen suicide and opioid overdose and all of these kinds of things. And uh, yet at the same time, as a staff, we manage to have a lot of laughs and uh, I think it's because I was raised on MASH reruns where surgeons were joking over the open bodies of uh, young people who had shrapnel in them. Uh, and I think maybe it's the way we preserve our mental health in this context is by having a very dark sense of humor. So I apologize if I am both uh, triggering and irreverent as I go through this. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Triggering and irreverent, you know, we were all, all of us who were raised in this country were taught to believe that we live in the land of liberty. Uh, and yet, as it turns out, as adults, when we look at the facts, the turns out that we are the incarceration nation. And while we have only 5% of the planet's human population, we've got 25% of the planet's incarcerated human population. And a great deal of that mass incarceration has to do with the fact that we don't have a mental health care system worth speaking of or naming with that word system. Uh, some irreverent people have suggested that systems do exactly what they were designed to do. In our case, it's incarcerate a lot of people who have unmet mental health needs, especially people of color. Uh, so that's where we live. and. Uh, Care Not Cuffs is our initiative to do something different. Hopefully the name of the campaign speaks to it pretty directly. It's really insisting that for our health care needs, we need health care and the other supports and services which enable humans to thrive even when they've got conditions uh, of various kinds, rather than this disaster area of uh, substance use epidemic, opioid overdoses, uh, people living under bridges and in parks, uh, and being handcuffed, tased, shot to death, uh, taken off to a so-called justice system where we have terrible things going on. Uh, the leading cause of death in jails is suicide. Um, we have an extremely high rate of people being held in solitary confinement uh, for prolonged periods of time. 
Most of the people who are incarcerated who have serious mental health conditions, those are the folks who are held in solitary confinement the longest. It's as ugly as it can get, uh, really, and we spare our children the sight of all this. I also joke that I have the kind of job that I can't talk about at the dinner table. Uh, my children are too young to hear about it. Uh, I don't want to give them any more nightmares than they're already getting from the trickle down of the daily news. And other polite company out there doesn't want to hear about it over dinner either. So thank you so much for joining me here <laughs> before dinner. Hopefully you've got strong stomachs. Um, so I've got some slides that are basically meant to keep me on track about some of the different initiatives that we're including under our Care to Cuffs uh, heading, but there's not a lot of substance there. Um, so I apologize for that. But the first thing I want to talk about is where we are right now in terms of an opportunity for Care Not Cuffs. And really, Care Not Cuffs is a name uh, that we came up with a couple of years ago, thinking we needed something catchy to catch the attention of people. Uh, we have no particular ownership over this name. If you look at hashtag Care Not Cuffs on Instagram or something like that, you'll see all kinds of stuff that doesn't necessarily come from us. And some of it's relevant to this work. Uh, and some of it isn't, but what we would really like is more people to be thinking about Care Not Cuffs as something that we all need. And so one of the things we would love affiliates to do is be thinking about how some of the things that we're doing are things that you could be doing and how we could all be working together to get this going in a more accelerated way uh, nationwide. So right now, as you all I'm sure know, we're on the verge of this moment, July 16th, when the 988 number will go live nationally. Uh, and I think that this is a great cultural opportunity for us as a nation. Um, what it means is, I'll talk about what it immediately means in a minute, but what it means in the longer sort of cultural change uh, perspective of things is that just as we all grew up thinking of 911 as those handy digits for emergencies, Today's 12-year-olds and 9-year-olds, like my two sons, by the time they're my age, they're going to have 988 literacy. And that's potentially huge for mental health across the country because we'll have a whole generation of young Americans who understand that there's these two emergency numbers out there that everybody's got at the tip of their tongues. One of them is 911, which means something over here. And the other one's 988, and that's about a mental health crisis. And uh, how we distinguish between those two things is going to be the challenge for the generation. And the kind of response we get when we dial those two numbers is also a challenge uh, for the moment, as well as a challenge for the generation. And so now the immediate implications of 988 is that just because the number goes live, and in many parts of the country, you can already dial 988 and get an emergency dispatcher with your phone. Uh, but just because you dial 988 doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a mental health specific response. Um, what a lot of people don't understand is that 911, which we think of as this magic American number, uh, is not a magic number. It is a locally administrated number. And what's magic about it is the technology, so that if I'm here with my Colorado phone and I dial 911, I'm going to get a dispatcher in DC because of the magic of satellites and all that kind of geolocation stuff. Um, so that's magical. But as far as the administration of 911, it's local. It's going to go to a local dispatcher, and whatever's available here in DC is going to come to me for whatever it is that happens to be going on. Uh, and so when it comes to a 988 administration, the country is not ready. Newsflash, on July 16th, you dial 988 on your phone, doesn't mean that you're going to get wonderful mental health clinicians answering that call or mobile outreach from mental health collect, clinicians who know how to assess a situation, de-escalate people, transport them to appropriate inpatient care if needed, or refer them to outpatient care if that's more appropriate. That magic is not ready. Uh, what will happen, likely, I mean, I'm thinking, is that since the number works, when I dial 988 from anywhere in the country, uh, the geolocation, I'm not exactly sure where we are with that. Uh, but hopefully that's coming quickly. 
But what will happen is that it's going to go to an emergency dispatcher. And in a lot of places in the country, particularly in rural and frontier areas, my expectation is that it's going to go to the same emergency dispatcher that a 911 call goes to. And then what happens? Well, it depends on the community. Maybe that community have, will have done some training for its dispatchers to make some sort of a triage distinction between a call that's coming in from a 911 line uh, versus a call that's going to a 988 line. But that's not a sure thing. There's no federal rollout of any of that. That is local, as local as it gets. Uh, Colorado, thanks to the efforts of our policy team, particularly Senator Mo Keller, who's our Director of Advocacy and has served in the Colorado Legislature for 16 years. Last year, we passed a local, we passed a Colorado state bill that implements a surcharge on our phone bills, just like our 911 system, so that now we're going to have about $20 million per year coming into the state to manage 988, whatever that means. Um, we had a previously existing Colorado Crisis Services 10-digit number uh, hotline that had some um, mobile response in limited settings around the state, uh, but did have at least 24-7 clinical response. So that entity is positioned to take on the greater volume of call that's expected with the new 988 number but they need to hire 160 staff to do that. And the last I heard, we've got a workforce shortage, not just in Colorado, but nationwide. So staffing up that crisis system in Colorado, we're not there yet by July. Uh, and we, Colorado is one of the four states only that passed legislation to create some kind of a preparatory funding stream for 988 rollout. The whole rest of the country still has to catch up. Uh, I was too young to remember or to know that 911 wasn't magic overnight either. It took a number of years for all of the counties across the country to get to a place of readiness for real effective 911 response. We may have some years ahead of us before 988 works as wonderfully as 911 does. And so in the meantime, what do we do when we're calling for a mental health crisis? The message that we've been trying to teach the public and the consumers that constantly reaching out to us with concern about their loved ones for whom it is sometimes seemingly impossible to get any kind of immediate access to quality care is that don't wait till it's an emergency. Try and get care well before a crisis occurs. If you are in a state of crisis, the best thing you can possibly do for yourself or your loved one is be your own advocate or be their advocate by sharing as much specific information as possible with whoever's on that line. You need to stipulate that this is my teenage daughter. She's not in need of police intervention. This is not a public safety matter. This is a mental health crisis. I need a respondent who can de-escalate her and keep her safe without this becoming something that we don't want it to be. Because what we know is that when people call in distress about their mental health crises, the police are the first to arrive because they're everywhere and they're super mobile, but their toolkit is extremely limited. They've got loud voices, they've got weaponry, and they've got handcuffs, and that's what they use. And uh, so you end up with your teenage daughter being knelt on uh, on the kitchen floor or tased or something because she was cutting herself or threatening to hurt herself or something like that. And so you need to be your best, your own best advocate. And Care Not Cuffs is really the, uh, a dual advocacy effort. And one is to create that local demand that you should be calling your local dispatchers, whoever those are. Sometimes it's managed by the law enforcement. Sometimes it's managed by um, uh, county commissioners own the dispatch office. It varies from part of the country, one part of the country to another, find out who manages emergency response, ask them their state of readiness to do effective 988 mental health response, and then advocate like crazy in your communities so that there is some state of readiness there, that there's at least some training. So the dispatcher asks some questions that are intended to discern whether this is 911 emergency, is it a stroke, do we need EMTs there who are 
able to like do paddles and like resuscitate somebody? Is it somebody, you know, brandishing a firearm and, and being dangerous and threatening in a way that really demands police response? Or is this something that is a mental health response? Uh, you need to advocate locally for that state of preparedness. And then you also need to educate your consumer population to be their own most effective self-advocates and to know that don't wait until you're in a state of emergency to discover that we don't have a great response system for a mental health emergency, which is what happens to most Americans in mental health distress. They call in a state of distress and there's this cascade of horror show that can end in death uh, but also ends in arrest and prolonged exposure to uh, the criminal legal system. Um, so people should know that before they have an emergency rather than after. So this is all the exciting good news. Um, so anyway, 98's happening in five years time or six years time or eight years time. It may mean that we're in a transformed world for our mental health crisis response, but we've got a lot of advocacy to do between now and then. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the other stuff. Let's see. What's happening here? Down? Next? No. Hmm. Is this a touch screen? No, I can't advance my slides. Sorry. Well, fortunately, I've got them on my iPhone, so I can at least... Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. All right, some more things, uh, and this will be quicker. These are just some of the other things that we're doing. We're tr we've been uh, talking about disentangling mental health and criminal justice as one of the main, um, you know, mission statements of a care not cuffs effort. Uh, some of the other things that we've been doing locally in Colorado is what we've been calling our Safer Initiative, um, and it has something to do with solutions for achieving fast, effective response. Somebody was coming up with an acronym here. Um, but what this really was, was a COVID-based response to what happened in 2020 when the country shut down, which is something that nobody anticipated. In, and I was doing this kind of advocacy about disentangling mental health and criminal justice before. And what I've been saying is that in 2019, if I'd come into a crowd of, uh, law enforcement and prosecutors and judges and said, look, what we need to do is we need to downsize our jail population by 50% because these people are not a threat to public safety and we need to do it overnight. Everybody would have just laughed me out of the room. And yet in mid-March in 2020, the country shut down. The jails nationwide downsized their populations by 50 to 60% within something like 60 days. Because the reality is, is that 50 to 60% of the people being held pre-trial behind bars in this country are not a threat to public safety. Many of them are being held for failures to appear or inability to post a bond. Uh, so as soon as the jail staff was worried about COVID exposure within the context of the jail, they just pushed all those people right out into the streets. And a lot of them were being pushed out to a state of being unhoused which is what led them into the jail to begin with, because they're committing the kinds of crimes that people with houses do all the time in the privacy of their own homes and uh, don't have any problem with. So what SAFER is was a very local initiative focused on that population of folks who'd, be, who'd been downsized out of the jail to a state of being unhoused. Uh, and what they needed was case management. They needed somebody to figure out what their needs were and help them navigate the ridiculous system uh, which doesn't speak, you know, one hand doesn't talk to the other. Um, so we put a, care manager, a case manager in place who could do things like help people get ID, uh, help people register for all of the benefits for which they're able to, you know, which, for which they're eligible, help them get access to our local community mental health center for behavioral health care, get access to our local federally qualified health center for the other kinds of health care, uh, help them get from point A to point B, help them find more permanent housing, help them find employment, all those kinds of things. SAFER started doing that thanks to a grant that was COVID relief money. Uh, and so that's been an effective intervention that every single community in the country needs because people are discharged from the so-called justice system 
to homelessness all the time and dropped just like that right out into the streets. And even if they've been stabilized in the context of a jail, which is miraculous, but it does sometimes happen that somebody's on medication or something like that and is at least getting a couple of meals a day and uh, has a place to sleep, uh, as soon as they're kicked back out to the streets, they start falling apart again. Uh, and then within several days, they're doing something out there that gets them in trouble again, so they cycle back in. So we hear about people who are arrested eight times in the course of a year, um, stuff like that. So everybody needs an intervention that's going to keep people from being discharged to homelessness, and it often has to do with case management into healthcare. And then the other thing to mention is the Pathways Home Initiative. We are very fortunate to have a very progressive uh, director of our department, of corrections, Dean Williams in the state of Colorado, who is well aware that a huge percentage of the people that he is holding in custody in the state's prisons are people who have unmet health needs, who've had unmet health needs over the course of a lifetime, uh, and that they all have a very hard time doing re-entry at the end of their sentences. As the DOC directors all over the place will remind us that just because we, the people, think that we're sending somebody off to prison, we're getting rid of them. The fact of the matter is that 90% of the people we send off to prison are coming back into the community. And so it really would make sense to make sure that people come back to the community in better shape than they went in. Does, nobody does that systematically. Uh, Pathways Home is an interesting initiative that we did in partnership with um, MHA National. And this was to do training for peer support services providing with folks in custody in DOC who were within a, like a three month horizon of the end of their sentence to get them trained as peer support service providers so that they could spend the final months of their sentence acting as peer support service providers to their peers within the DOC. Uh, but then as they come back out into the community, being able to continue to serve as peer support service providers and bridge that re-entry for folks following them in consecutive cohorts of release out of DOC. Every community needs to be doing something like that. Peer support services are one of the most effective ways of upholding somebody's well-being uh, within a system where you see a clinician for 15 minutes, once every couple of months, a peer can be there for somebody much more regularly, and that kind of peer support is great. Um, I want to mention another bit of the work we've been doing. You know, one of the terrible things about our so-called system is that, oddly enough, some of the best allies for mental health advocacy are within the ranks of law enforcement. Uh, and it's because they know better than anybody in the country the extent to which their work is working with people who've got unmet health needs. They do it every day. Something like an estimated 30% of 911 law enforcement calls are related to a mental health crisis or another. And police everywhere will say, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up to like drive fast cars and chase bad guys and lock people up. I didn't sign up to deal with all of these people who are in mental health crisis, and yet they are. Uh, and the ones who aren't complaining about it are the ones who are getting smarter and smarter about it and doing things to divert people and redirect them away from the justice system and toward healthcare. Some of those key leaders are our nation's prosecutors. Some of the smart prosecutors are being extremely effective as they review the week's arrests in discerning which of these people really needs to be prosecuted as a matter of public safety, and which of these people just need some of the healthcare they've never gotten before. And so we've been convening since 2016 what we've been calling the Prosecution Research Network, which is prosecutors from about 40 different uh, districts around the country, rural, urban, and frontier, who are doing what we call prosecutor-led diversion. Um, and uh, the idea behind uh, convening the network is it gives them an opportunity to share with each other because everybody's inventing this for their own, you know, they're making it up as they go along. And we thought that by convening them, we could help them learn from each other and expedite their 
learning curves and then also hopefully encourage some other prosecutors to begin doing similar work. So uh, in 2020, we held a summit for them, invited a bunch of other prosecutors, and then produced a framework document that sort of outlines the contents of um, prosecutor-led diversion. That's a document that's available on our website and uh, really encourage you to engage prosecutors in getting this work done. They are um, very effective, not just in that redirection moment of discerning that this is not worth prosecuting, but they're also great local advocates because it's one thing for me, the 501c3 nonprofit mental health advocate guy to be up there screaming, yelling about disentangling mental health and criminal justice, but it's a totally different story if your DA is up there saying the same thing to that community. You'll get the police to listen, the mayors, the county commissioners, everybody starts paying attention. So cultivating those advocates um, is, I think, a smart way to go. Um, all right, let's see, what else? The model legal processes. Um, this is a group, if you've never heard of him, there's a guy named Judge Steve Leifman who's from Miami-Dade County, California, I mean, Florida. And uh, I think of him as like the Mick Jagger of disentangling mental health and criminal justice because he's all over the place once you start looking into it. And um, back in 2016 or so, he pointed out that nationwide, you know, we've got some variation in our civil commitment laws out there, but the, as a general state of affairs, civil commitment laws in many states date back to the 18th century or the 19th century and are based on fear uh, and without any kind of a medical understanding of the nature of mental illness. And so his observation is that given that we have advanced in our understanding of mental illness, uh, it might be a good idea to revisit those commitment laws and bring them into alignment with modern science as well as with modern values. Commitment doesn't need to mean what it meant back in the 18th century, which is kind of locking the door and throwing away the key and putting people in asylum settings where there's no health science, uh, where you're basically just isolating and segregating uh, people, restraining them, subjecting them to all kinds of weird, terrifying experimentation. Uh, Today, the, the modern horror movie uh, film industry is still filled with asylums as uh, a feature of that landscape. It doesn't have to be that way. Asylum is a word that means sanctuary. Uh, people can be so seriously mentally ill that they do need to be confined for their own safety, but they could be cared for compassionately with all of the skills of uh, modern health science that are people oriented. And commitment also doesn't need to mean inpatient commitment for the rest of your life. Somebody might need inpatient care for three weeks. Uh, another person might not need any inpatient care at all, but what they need is outpatient care in an assertive kind of way where somebody will, if you don't show up for your appointment, somebody will show up to where you are and say, hey, where were you on Friday? Here it is Saturday. You know, I'm here with your, uh, you know, to assess and determine where you are with your medications and treatment plan and things like that. We need some kind of a modern um, approach to commitment. And so the Model Legal Processes Work Group was formed with uh, Judge Leifman leading it and a bunch of stellar experts in um, forensic mental health law as well as um, Forensic psychiatrists from all over the country, um, Judge Leifman, Judge Milt Mack from Michigan, uh, Richard Slobogan from Vanderbilt University, Ken Minkoff from Harvard University, uh, a bunch of great folks. They're all listed on our website, and they've been working for the past few years on suggested language for how to revisit civil commitment law. And that work is about done. They're doing some final editing over the course of the next month. Uh, and then we're going to release that nationwide. And it's not meant to be prescriptive, like here's the language, you should just advocate for this and make this happen in your state. 
the idea is here's some suggested language, here's a bunch of authorities making these suggestions, please at least rekindle the conversation and make this state specific as makes sense to your state, but we really want that conversation to happen um, all over the place. You know, we have, as advocates, uh, we've basically let the legal experts do their work on this work group while refraining from getting involved in the nitpicky language that they're uh, producing. One of our concerns, which we will wrestle with over the course of coming months, uh, is that they depart from this totally legitimate premise, which is that the justice pathway is absolutely the wrong pathway. We want care, not cuffs. We should never be telling parents, oh, just wait till your adult child with serious mental illness does something serious enough that you can get them arrested for in order to get them care, that we say that, and that is a truth around the country, is as abominable as can be. We should not be that way. There should be another pathway. And so the group has been departing from that premise that what we're doing is totally unacceptable. Uh, our concern as advocates is that they point to healthcare and they point to healthcare and they point to healthcare. What they don't fully, you know, it doesn't make sense. They can't wrap it into the language that they're working on is that there is no healthcare there. Uh, they want, they're framing this as diversion, but it's divert to what? Because of our largely private system and our sort of cherry picking public system. That's why we've got this slippery slope into the justice system because nobody wants to take the people with serious mental illness who need that care because it's not profitable. And, um, you know, those people are challenging. Um, so we're pointing towards something that is not there, and that really is the weight for our persisting advocacy is where is the pressure on our healthcare system to do both inpatient and outpatient psychiatry effectively, uh, even if it's not profitable, and um, be as, you know, as, um, as furious as we advocates are about the justice system alternative. You would think that somebody who has sworn a Hippocratic oath to do no harm uh, would be doing every possible thing to keep somebody from going into the justice system when what they need is health care. Um, so stay tuned for more about that model legal processes work group. I just want to mention uh, the course correction summit. And this is actually backwards chronologically. Um, back when I started doing work at this intersection, one of the first things we started doing were these course correction summits, and the idea there was sort of based on um, the consensus building framework of how the founders of the country got their stuff together, and that was by having powwowing in the course of the Continental Congress and then writing some documents like a Declaration of Independence and a Constitution and then signing the documents so that they were like deciding to hang together uh, rather than hang separately and making that kind of commitment and accountability. So we thought, I know, let's start convening local leadership and getting them to articulate, first of all, a shared understanding of the state of our current crisis we're in a national public health crisis where we have this slippery slope to the justice system. Uh, articulate that clearly, sign our names to it, and then make some locally specific recommendations as to a pathway out of this crisis and get them to sign their names to it. So the first one we held was uh, back in 2016 in this, for the state of Colorado. Uh, and we had all the right people there in terms of the heads of our Departments of Human Services and uh, Office of Behavioral Health and Department of Corrections and folks from the Supreme Court of the State of Colorado and the uh, Colorado District Attorneys Association, the Colorado Sheriffs and all that stuff. And we drafted a document after the meeting that had a preamble stating the state of crisis that we unreasonably default to our justice system instead of providing care. They made a series of recommendations. 
They got a chance to review the document over several iterations, and then we put their signatures on the bottom of it and used it for statewide advocacy. And one of the first outcomes of that was the, first, the top recommendation. Back at that time, Colorado was one of six remaining states that was using our county jails for men, emergency mental health holds. Uh, so if you're put on a 72-hour hold, they could put you in handcuffs and take you to jail and stick you in solitary confinement. Um, we said that, no, you can't be using the jails anymore for these mental health holds. And so there was a piece of legislation in 2017 that passed eliminating the use of jails for those mental health holds. And the state has remained focused on the series of recommendations that came out of that initial summit ever since. Uh, we subsequently held summits for the Mid-Atlantic region in partnership with um, NACO and NAMI here in the D.C. area. So it was Southern Maryland and Northern Virginia and D.C. We did it with the state of Indiana, with NAMI Indiana. Uh, we did it with the city and county of Milwaukee, which is, has one of the highest rates of incarceration in the country. It's also the most segregated community in the country. Um, Let's see, a number of other places. And then we also did sector-specific uh, convenings. We held a convening at Georgetown University that was focused on severe mental illness exemptions to the death penalty uh, in partnership with a number of other co-advocacy organizations, including the American Bar Association and the Eighth Amendment Project, Catholic Mobilizing Network, Georgetown's Prisons and Justice Initiative. Uh, the following year, we held another initiative focused on mental health uh, law and policy, uh, also at Georgetown. And each of these uh, produced a document that all of the participating folks ended up being sort of the co-authors of a document that has similar preamble about the state of crisis and a set of recommendations. Uh, those are all available on our website. One of the m best of the summits was one we held in Los Angeles at the downtown LAPD headquarters, which was the National Law Enforcement Summit on Mental Health and Criminal Justice. And we had police and sheriffs and district attorneys from all over the country uh, there for that event. And that was just a powerhouse bunch of folks when you get a bunch of badges uh, under the same roof to talk about how we're doing the wrong thing. Uh, locking people up who need health care. And, um, you know, every community should focus on cultivating that law enforcement effort. Some of the most recent ones, which are up on the slide here, back in November, we held a National Prosecutor Summit. It was virtual. Uh, and then in April, we held, rather than just focusing on the death penalty, uh, we reconvened some of those death penalty folks, but also focused on excessive sentencing. Uh, of all the developed nations in the world, ours is the so-called developed nation that has medieval-style sentencing. Uh, none of the developed nations have sentences that exceed about 23 years. Uh, so even somebody who has committed mass murder, like on the scale of there was a fellow who went into a youth camp park in Norway uh, several years back and killed a lot of people, it's a 23-year sentence. They can re-up re that sentence every 23 years and effectively keep somebody locked away for life. But they don't do things like sentence people to 600 years the way we do in this country, which means, because imagine, what are we doing? Locking their skeletons to the wall and just sort of making sure that the skeleton is there still 400 years later? We're medieval in our, in our practices. Um, Excessive sentencing doesn't serve any kind of a purpose. People who are sentenced in their 20s and have served 40 years into their 60s, these people are not threats to public safety anymore. Uh, they're just ill in many cases. And what they need is health care and supportive housing and things like that. If we don't get around our so-called justice system and on a pathway to healthcare, we're never going to experience the kind of long-term vitality that those developed nations experience in terms of an overall sense of human well-being from one end of life to another, where you're not aging into fear and poverty and distress uh, the way we do too often in this country. So that was a great group. All of this stuff is, since it was virtual, is recorded and available. Uh, on our website, as long as the as well as the materials that folks brought along. 
Uh, and then we had just a couple of weeks ago our rural summit series, and this was based on the observation of some of the prosecutors back in November who said that, hey, this is all great, but what you've got is presentations from people from LA, New York City, Dallas, uh, Houston, Denver. What about all of us in rural and frontier communities who do not have these kinds of resources and we're managing geographical areas the size of Maryland uh, or something like that. It only have a population of 40,000 people. Uh, and so we did a rural summit series for those communities so that they could share some of the work that they're doing with each other. And that stuff's all recorded as well. Uh, and there, it's all about care, not cost. So let's see the next one. Yeah, and this is just local. And this is just another suggestion is that, you know, after um, convening the Colorado group in a big way on that kind of annual convening, we in a virtual way, just every month, have a very short meeting, 30 to 45 minutes or so, uh, for all Colorado allies and partners who are working to disentangle mental health and criminal justice to get on the phone. We schedule a presenter from somebody somewhere around the community who's doing intervention at some level or another, just so that we don't, we're doing a little bit of something to break down the silos between people's areas of operation. Uh, where they're doing brilliant work, but nobody hears about it outside their immediate scope. We really wanted, as an advocacy group, to make sure that people knew that they had allies uh, and that this great work that you're doing in isolation in this district court setting, you've got other folks doing similar things around the state. You're part of a movement, and that's kind of our contribution is to make people understand that they're part of a movement. It's about care, not cuffs, and we've got allies at every level that are doing this. And, you know, it begins with making sure that people are getting care across the lifespan. We talk about our mission being healthier minds across the lifespan and beginning with a small, a strong start for children and doing perinatal mental health care that's multi-generational and focused on those family ecosystems. Uh, through wellness and aging so that we've got appropriate training for dementia care uh, across all emergency response systems so that we don't have instances of police just arresting uh, elderly folks for urinating in the park when they don't know where the heck they are and they need to relieve themselves. Uh, that doesn't need to be an arrest in a criminal charge in a humane world. This needs to be a diversion toward healthcare. Um, all of these things need to be happening at once. And so we've just been articulating this sequence of how you respond compassionately and appropriately to redirect people toward healthcare and to build up healthcare capacity where there isn't current healthcare capacity uh, so as to create that kind of demand. And um, I can go out and provide, I'll say a little bit about the different things that we're representing here. Um, in this group, and then I'll leave some time for questions. Um, but across this scope of things, you know, we wanted to highlight back in April of last year the work being done by one of our community mental health centers in co-responder work. Um, co-responder work is one of the best early stages of crisis intervention where you've got a law enforcement agency that is cooperating with a mental health provider or behavioral health provider organization in one way or another so that they respond simultaneously to a distress call uh, so that the police are there to ascertain whether this truly is a matter of public safety or not and whether or not they can safely step back and just let the clinicians do their work of de-escalation needs assessment uh, and you know disposition of the client um, so we do have a number of different community mental health centers in our community. They're doing that kind of effective co-responder work. Um, one of the other innovations in Colorado, uh, which does exist in a few other places around the country, like most notably like in Eugene, Oregon with their CAHOOTS group, is a crisis response that is not even a co-responder. There's not a police involved. Uh, police are available to a mobile clinical response team in case there is a public safety need to involve the police, but it's really a mobile clinical team that responds. And Denver's, uh, the Mental Health Center of Denver, the CMHC based in Denver, 
started their STAR program in the summer of 2020. In the course of the first year and a half of their operations, they went out on something like 1,500 calls. Uh, there were something like three arrests out of all those calls. And 80% of the responses were de-escalated, assessed and managed on site, did not require any kind of transport to any other kind of facility. And so our view, that's the gold standard for crisis response, is that there is mobile response uh, that is able to provide that kind of care. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, we had Judge Jonathan Seamus. Um, he's been uh, a key figure in rural um, judicial mental health. He's been a real advocate for making sure that there's a judicial bench book for mental health guidelines for judges who, in some districts, don't necessarily know anything at all about mental health when they're appointed to the bench or elected to the bench. Um, and one of the things that we like to bring him in as an advocacy for is just as prosecutors are super effective in being more persuasive than a mental health advocate and getting other community partners, there's nothing like a judge uh, to call a meeting of the county commissioners, the police department, the hospital. People come when the judge calls. And so a judge is often your best partner in your community if you can get a judge to be a co-advocate. Uh, and he's doing all kinds of interesting uh, bench-led diversion um, that we could tell you more about. Um, you know, Amanda Edwards was with us from our Office of Behavioral Health. One of the things about Colorado is that we've got a competency backlog that has resulted in a federal lawsuit and consent decree based on violating the constitutional rights of Coloradans who were held over the long in jail settings pre-trial. Many states are in this set of circumstances where you're arrested, you're mentally ill, you're determined to be incompetent to proceed with your judicial process, and so you need to be restored to competency, usually through access to your state mental institute. Well, our state mental institute doesn't have open doors. We've had people held behind bars for minor charges for up to a, uh, up to a year and a half in some cases awaiting that access. This is a constitutional rights violation uh, ruled against the state's Department of Human Services. The state is under a federal consent decree that has a very strict schedule about how long you can hold somebody pre-trial with a known mental health need as you're awaiting that access. And uh, for every day that exceeds that period, the state pays fines. The state of Colorado has paid about $10 million in fines. Uh, each year since that federal consent decree uh, came down in 2019. Uh, and so we're in a state of distress. And one of the things that the state has created is a what they call the Bridges um, team, which is part of this forensic support team. And that's assigning liaisons in each judicial district who are folks that are kind of like reference librarians for the prospective pathways away from incarceration so they can inform the court so that if somebody comes before the judge, the Bridges person who works with the court, not with the defendant, can come to the judge and say, look, for this person who's experiencing these sets of conditions, here's what the community has to offer. So the judge has somebody to uh, better inform her about what um, the prospects are. Uh, so that's great work. And then I just wanted to mention harm reduction, uh, really key. One of the great things we've got going on in Denver is our Harm Reduction Action Center. And this is based on the public health principle that the war on drugs is not the right solution. People who are uh, addicted to substances don't benefit from jail time. Uh, they're harmed by that. The risk of overdose upon release from jail is higher than it is pre-arrest. Uh, Drug use is a public health matter. Uh, harm reduction is about making sure that people are using clean syringes uh, or that they're not using drugs that are tainted with deadly fentanyl uh, when they think that they're using something else. Harm reduction eventually should also mean things like safe use sites and total decriminalization, such as the state of Oregon. Uh, has recently done and has been modeled in places like Portugal, uh, which was the first, I think, to do it. 
nearly 20 years ago and has led to really strong results. There's a great track record for lowered rates of uh, needle transmitted disease um, and um, uh, lowered rates of overdose and better health outcomes. So harm reduction, like ending that excessive sentencing, uh, should be really the path to the future for um, Americans who want to be a developed nation that does something that other than providing cuffs rather than care for people who need it. And then I guess I would also just say that uh, we're always talking about crisis and how to manage crisis differently. We're going to be in a state of crisis forever, uh, I'm afraid, until we do something about the state of the nation. And what's missing, uh, and I'll just quickly observe that every time I've been part of one of these governor's behavioral health task forces, there's a moment at the very beginning of a series of meetings where all of the experts in the room in, come to an immediate agreement. And they talk about the social determinants of health. They talk about, wow, we really ought to get ahead of this crisis. You know what that means? That means readily accessible health care. It means universal child care. It means meaningful paid family leave. It means a living wage. It means affordable housing. The kinds of basics that the developed nations have covered. Since we don't do those things, we're in a state of crisis because we have a desperate population that can't make it work out there. And every one of these meeting, task force meetings, the experts in the room all immediately agree about that, but then the whole rest of the six months of conversation is back to the healthcare system because all the experts in the room, that's all they know about. They know about the healthcare system. They don't know how to change laws and make policy that promote human health and well-being in that really big picture. And until we get to that kind of big picture policy change, we are going to have humans in a state of distress and crisis and bumping up against a crisis system that's not really there to begin with. So that's my cheery end note. And I would happily answer any questions or make further comments. All right, opening it up to questions in the room. And we do have a couple online as well. Is there anyone here who'd like to, who has a question for Vincent? You did a really thorough job. <laughs> um, but some of the questions online here. So a question from Marcy. Um, I'm curious if you have any research on what measures um, that can help with the crisis worker shortage. <sighs> <laughs> No. <laughs> um, no. I mean, I think that um, we need to do those things. We hear about m making sure that we're enabling people to practice at the top of their license um, so that we don't have sort of these arbitrary regulatory distinctions about what level of licensure you have in order have to have in order to provide certain levels of care. We should remove as many of those barriers as possible, and we should mobilize a peer army uh, as quickly as possible so that people who do not have extensive training, uh, academic training, but do have lived experience can provide case management navigational support for people. Um, I think that um, crisis can be de-escalated meaningfully by a lot of different kinds of people. What I tell healthcare industry folks all the time is that they ought to focus on their frontline reception staff more and more in hospital emergency departments and people answering phones. Because back in the Middle Ages when hospitals were invented, there was no health science, but what there was was compassion. And what you had were people reaching out and putting a hand on somebody and comforting them as they were dying or suffering in terrible distress. And now what we've got is short-tempered people on telephones being rude, asking the wrong questions, being impatient, or people at desks and emergency departments just ordering you to go sit down uh, and wait your turn. If you cultivated more peer support services on that front end where that first contact as you're presenting yourself in the emergency room is somebody who's got 
enough training and support from their employers to have a moment of compassion and say, hey, I'm doing triage as I look at you. And since you're not bleeding to death, I need to ask you to wait because we have some people bleeding to death over here. But in the meantime, here's a space blanket to keep warm and here's a warm cup of tea. And there's some biscuits over here or whatever, but a little bit more frontline compassion would de-escalate people. And when you train cops to do crisis intervention, that's really what you're doing, is you're teaching them not to be bristling with armaments and using words of command. You're teaching them to wear a polo shirt and keep their hands down at their sides in a less threatening way and speak in a calm voice and find out what's going on. You can do a lot of crisis intervention just by cultivating a little bit more compassion and humanity and making that a priority across a system that prioritizes profit over people. Um, you may have covered some of this. This question was received early on, um, but Justine asks, what is your relationship with law enforcement? Uh, can you discuss how this initiative has gotten off the ground in Colorado? Yeah, so, you know, we got launched based on reaching out to law enforcement and asking, and uh, based on this presumption that, hey, you all deal with a lot of mental health crisis. How can we help? Uh, as an advocacy organization. And so it's been a really fruitful relationship where we have been elevating them as leaders. And part of the Care Not Cuffs campaign that we've been running, we've been thinking of as like, who are the local heroes? Uh, there's been great local heroes. There's a group called the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Support Bureau, uh, which has been doing law enforcement assisted diversion education across law enforcement agencies around the country. And these chiefs and sheriffs are local heroes because they are making it an agency priority to deflect people away from arrest and incarceration as much as possible. Uh, and so we've been wanting to sort of put a spotlight on them. And when we're in a moment where people have been talking about things like defunding the police and hating on the police, we've been saying something totally different, like, look at these cops. These cops are getting it right. Let's have them set the standard for what policing ought to look like uh, in their communities. And so by cultivating that kind of a uh, partnership, we do well. And you know, one of the things I'll observe, one of our best partners has been uh, Sheriff Pelly, who's outgoing in, the, in Boulder County in Colorado. And he's been a, just a champion uh, for mental health and has one of the earliest co-responder programs uh, in the country, if not the state. And one of the things that he's observed is that they've had great funding for that co-responder program, but what it covers is enough staffing to run the program from like 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. five days a week. Wouldn't it be nice to have effective crisis response 24-7? Uh, and it's not like he's look he needs $10 million more a year. It's some relatively small numbers of hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. Uh, and so that's where a lot of these programs are, is they are partially funded as sort of pilot-like efforts and why the co-advocacy of an advocacy group can be super effective locally in trying to get more funding diverted so that your great local hero cop who's doing the right thing can do the right thing 24-7, 365 days a year uh, instead of five days a week. Thank you. We do have, oh, any, any questions in the room? We have a minute or two. Yeah. So you got 30 seconds to solve the world's problems. Thank you. Hi, Pierre Luigi Mancini from Atlanta. Thank you so much. And this may be longer than 30 seconds, so we can talk after. Um, during the work that you've done, have you encountered or seen some solutions for individuals who speak other languages or who have a different cultural understanding of mental illness? Great, great question. Uh, and I'm afraid not. Uh, you know, I think that our, our response rate is scanty when it comes to English speaking people. One of the things we observe in Colorado, which has a fairly substantial Spanish speaking population, is that something like three to 4% of our behavioral health provider uh, population is culturally competent to serve people in Spanish. And then anecdotally, what we hear from the Spanish speaking population is that 
well, even then, you know, I've seen a provider who claims to speak Spanish, but what it turned out to be was a Spanish lesson for the provider in how to speak Spanish about my concerns. Because people will say they're Spanish speaking on their resumes, but the fact of the matter is maybe they took Spanish in the eighth grade or something like that, but they're not really qualified to serve um, out there. And then when you get to other kinds of cultures, not just language cultures, but traditional medicine cultures and all these different kinds of things, there is a, it's a wasteland out there, uh, which is why things are bleaker than they seem. You know, we've been ranked last in the country for adult need for care versus access to care. Uh, but those are the adults who seek care. 50% of people who need care are not even seeking care. And uh, it's because they know that there's nothing out there for them or what is out there does not, is not culturally suitable. Our Western model of diagnosing and prescribing pharmaceuticals, there's a whole lot of people out there, maybe 50% of people who just reject that flatly. And we need to uh, heed the latest report guidance from the World Health Organization, which is really a call to action about diversifying our approaches to supporting people's mental health and well-being. There's a great 300-page report from the World Health Organization just out this year that provides that kind of guidance. Guidance on the World Health Organization's 2021 guidance on community mental health. I think it's the guidance on community mental health. I've, I've got a link I can pull out of my pocket for you. All righty. Thank you so much, Vincent. Very happy to have you and have all of you join us. Thank you. Here, it's right here.